Hi, welcome back to Chainlift. Let me ask you a question. What color should this be? Well, it depends. First of all, what even is this thing? Well, this component is called a snack bar. And a snack bar is also called a toast. It's something that shows a short update about app processes, usually at the bottom of the screen. Now, this snapshot is from the Material 3 design kit. In LiftKit, the snack bar can show up pretty much anywhere. This is an app called Ticket Fair. It was made using LiftKit. And if you click on the save button over here, a snack bar pops up at the top to let you know that it went okay. Now, what color should this be? Well, given that it, we can clearly see that it has a check mark and that the message content is giving us good news, that's right, the color is success. But why wouldn't I just say green? Well, that's because colors have meaning. But that meaning is not intrinsic. It's derived from two sources, and I want to be very clear about that. The first place where colors get their meaning from is called literal context. Uh, and that's just because without context, color is meaningless. You know those color charts you see all the time on like Pinterest and Facebook that'll say, ah, here's what, you know, all the different colors symbolize. They always start with the positives, but then as soon as you see like, oh yeah, green means nature, it's like, oh, uh, and nuclear waste. And if there's this whole spectrum of things that colors can symbolize, but they symbolize so many different things that it kind of loses all of its meaning. If something can mean anything, then it doesn't really mean anything at all. Colors mean different things depending on the literal context of the appearance. So why do I keep saying literal? Well, let's keep going with this snack bar example here. The literal context talks about the literal pixels on the page. We've been conditioned over time to know that red means error, yellow means warning, and green means success, but we've been trained this way because of you know non-color related things. Note that meaning is not lost when the color gets removed. It's just not as obvious at a glance. So the literal context of those icons and then the content of the messages is telling you what these colors mean. It's associating those colors with certain things. And if you're conditioned enough over time by using several different pieces of software that all follow the same rules, that color takes on the meaning by itself. We still have the context of the user flow and the message content. That's why in so many UI kits, um, they won't even deal with the badge like it does in LiftKit. It's not as good for accessibility, but you can kind of get away sometimes with just applying the background color directly to the container itself. Now, when we take the content away, and now we're left with just these little icons, we still have literal context, but it has completely changed what these colors mean because this is no longer indicating an error, warning, or success. It can't tell you anything about the message because the message doesn't exist. So the meaning of each color has changed completely because the literal context has changed completely. These are not snack bars anymore. They are now icon buttons. I gotta fix this slide. Oh my God, I'm so tired. As I was saying, these components are no longer snack bars, they are icon buttons. Uh, fun fact, LiftKit has 684 different icon button variants. That may be considered a bad practice to you. I call it being explicit. Anyways, these no longer mean error, warning, and success, because what red meant before, when it was a snack bar, is that something negative just happened. But when you've turned that into an interactive element, like a button, now, red has evolved to mean that if you click on this, something negative will happen. And so, meaning gets totally muddied up. Instead of error warning and success, those are now entirely too precise. Sticking with red, it means some kind of combination of no, delete, decline. It's, it's all of these things, but not any one particular one of them. It's just somehow vaguely negative just as yellow is vaguely tentative and green is vaguely affirmative. Literal context can justify doing things that seemingly make no sense, like putting a negative icon like this X on a green background. Little contradictions can be incredibly useful for deliberately slowing the user down. Like let's say your app has a button that will make the entire spaceship explode. You might make the cancel button green instead of red so that it'll give the user a chance to make sure they close any unsaved word docs that are open in the background. Let's keep going. If we remove the icon, 
then we leave the realm of literal context entirely and we're left with just colors again. So these are now meaningless, right? And no, you know, because literal context is one thing, but then we also have cultural context. And if you don't know what cultural context is, I mean, <laughs> you think your design just fell out of a coconut tree? <laughs> your work exists in the context of all the other apps your users interact with. Everything we see, we associate with something else, and that's especially true with color. And you might already be able to see where I'm going with this, and if not, how about now? Yeah, that's right. This is probably the most common pattern in UI design, at least for color. It's the first one that popped into my mind, and it's so ubiquitous. In fact, if I, you know, turn it on its side, look at that. UIs don't exist in a vacuum. We arrive when we open software with preconceived notions about what certain things are going to mean. Like, it doesn't matter that in this browser, the red circle doesn't literally mean stop. All it has to do is evoke some vague feeling of stoppiness. And it, of course, doesn't hurt that they reveal those icons on hover because that provides the literal context on top of the cultural context to correct the user's assumptions that they're bringing with them. Here's another question. Looking at this list of restaurants in an imaginary restaurant app, can you tell me which one of these probably sells chicken wings? Literal context tells us we have the word restaurants up there and the cultural context we're bringing with us is all of the mental images that are evoked when we see certain combinations of color. In this case, I might be looking at this app and I'm going to say like, all right, so here we go. We've got uh, the word restaurants. It's red combined with various shades of golden brown. And so I take this and I say, ah, <laughs> you know where else I see these colors? Fried chicken. And like, maybe, but it's not that straightforward. It's not like a one-to-one -one symbolic representation. No, it's more like the chicken matrix. We have associative minds that form relations that are not necessarily causal. All we know is that they have something to do with each other. And this is why advertising companies invest so much work in graphic designers that understand color psychology. Because they're competing for your attention. And it's not like we have crystal clear memories of all of these things. Instead, we're walking around with just vague feelings about this stuff. We're just vaguely aware of them and are unconscious. And so instead of storing all of those high resolution details in our brain, we're gonna store the big details. Details like color. That's what we bring with us when we come to the application. And it's also why, yeah, it would be the top one. I forgot to make the slide where it unblurs the photo, but you get the idea. Designers use all of this logic that we've been talking about in order to build color systems. Color systems are nothing more than just rules for how you use color in your apps. And we're going to go over two kinds. The first is called static and the second is dynamic. Now, static systems are the bulk of what you're accustomed to. It's where you have a set of predefined colors that you're allowed to choose from. And the onus is on the designer to decide what they're supposed to be used for. It's a set where the colors don't change. Uh, this would be uh, Mac OS, Tailwind are examples of static color systems. Dynamic systems are newer and they're very interesting. It's that thing where you can put in like a brand color or a phone wallpaper. It'll extract the main color from that and then the whole UI will become like tinted to match that color. That's what LiftKit uses. It uses the Material 3 Dynamic Color Engine. And here's how that works. You start with your main brand color. Then you feed that color into an algorithm that looks for where it is on the color wheel. It finds it, and it saves your main color like that, and then it'll find some neutral variants of it to use for things like backgrounds, outlines, things that don't have to be super saturated. Once it has those, it finds your accent color by rotating a little counterclockwise. Then it'll look for a red to use for your error tone, followed by a golden rod or an orange for warnings, a green for successes, and then a blue for info. Once it has all of these, it harmonizes them by balancing out their contrast ratios, making them easier to read. And that's how it gets the main colors. To review, we start with our seed color, put it into a palette generator algorithm, which finds these nine swatches for us. Now, these become our key colors. And to develop the rest of the color system though, 
we first need to split them up a little bit. So every key color gets split up into a tonal palette, and that tonal palette is then filtered into a smaller subset, because we don't really need all of these tones necessarily. And then the swatches from each subset get mapped to a color by number system, which sorts them into a light and a dark scheme. And this is what you give your designers. The whole system looks a little something like this. How do you actually use this? Well, you're going to have to stay tuned for part two, but in the meantime, you can check out these resources. Material has a lot of really great instructions on how to actually implement the color system that I just talked about. Uh, remember, I called it painting by numbers. That's actually their term, and it's the best way to kind of visualize how it works. They have a generator for Figma, and uh, the source code and everything else you need is linked on the Material website. If you want to run the generator in Webflow, you use Chainlift Color, at least until Material makes one. Then you can also check out the LiftKit docs for more info about the color system itself. And then finally, you can check LiftKit for Figma because that's a UI kit that's built with all of that. It works with Material's Theme Builder plugin. And uh, that was that. But in the meantime, thank you again for joining us here at Chainlift where great ideas get off the ground. Please keep your hands and feet in the vehicle at all times and enjoy the ride.